There is a two-page handout for this presentation, and it's easy to find. It's on my web page under Web Lectures. All right, my title, Was Adam a Real Person? This is quite a challenging issue today in light of evolutionary theory. And what I'd like to do is try to answer this question from an evolutionary creationist approach. And in a moment, I'll give a brief definition of this view of origins called evolutionary creation. I think it's important that I tell you right now what my position is on Adam right at the beginning of this lecture. In 2008, I wrote this book, Evolutionary Creation. In the final chapter, in the very first sentence of the first paragraph, I wrote the following. My central conclusion in this book is clear. Adam never existed, and this fact has no impact whatsoever on the foundational beliefs of Christianity. Now, I understand how shocking a statement this is to most Christians. In particular, I'm a born-again Christian, I'm an evangelical Christian, and you don't often hear such a position from evangelicals. In fact, about 30 years ago, if anyone would have told me this, I would have been pretty upset and basically written the person off. So what I'm going to ask you is uh, appeal to you for your patience and uh, see if I can explain uh, my view and argue the case why I don't think a real or a historical Adam is essential to Christian faith. Let me first outline some foundational beliefs of Christianity that are simply non-negotiable for me. And the moment I reject these foundational beliefs, I will no longer call myself a Christian. Well, first, God created humans. We're not a mistake. We didn't come about by blind chance. Two, that humans bear the image of God, and we're the only creatures who enjoy such a privileged status. Three, humans are sinful. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That God judges humans for sin. And finally, praise the Lord, that Jesus died for humans on the cross. As I said, these are non-negotiable. And the moment I reject these, I will no longer call myself a Christian. But I think this is the foundations of the faith. This is what changes people's lives. And to make my religious beliefs even more specific, I love Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men and women by which we must be saved. And that name is Jesus Christ. Again, this is a non-negotiable principle of my faith. And the moment I reject this passage, I reject my Christian faith. Now, interesting thing about this passage, did you notice, under heaven, this little phrase? We'll talk about this a little later in the presentation. Now, I did point out in my title that I was going to answer the question, was Adam a real person from an evolutionary creationist perspective? And I think we need a definition of evolutionary creation, and here it is. And you'll notice how conservative it is in terms of the historic Christian faith. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in other words, the Holy Trinity, created the universe and life, including humans, through an ordained, sustained, and design-reflecting evolutionary process. Ordained, meaning it was God's plan. He decided to create through an evolutionary process, that this evolutionary process was sustained, or in other words, upheld all the way through the eons of time, and that indeed nature reflects design including the evolutionary process. Well, there's so much confusion surrounding this term intelligent design today, and I think we need to give a proper definition, in particular a biblical and traditional definition of design. And it's simply this. Intelligent design is the belief 
It's a belief. It's not a scientific theory. There's no scientific instrument that can detect design. It is a belief that the beauty, the complexity, and functionality in nature point to an intelligent designer. Regrettably, a lot of people who talk about design today are always talking about complexity and functionality. What about God the artist, the beautiful aspect of nature? That's also part of the proper definition of intelligent design. So from an evolutionary creationist perspective, design even extends to the evolutionary process. And think of Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament, and we'll talk about this word firmament in a second, and the firmament proclaims the work of his hands. So in other words, nature as we experience it points us in the direction of some sort of creative mind behind this absolutely magnificent and spectacular world. To help Christians understand this idea of God creating through evolution, I like appealing to what is known as the embryology evolution analogy. In other words, think about when we were being created in our mother's womb, and then compare this to the overall evolution of life. First, in both embryology and evolution, there's divine creative action, whereby God creates through ordained and sustained natural processes. And there's none of this God of the gaps. And what I mean by that, there isn't this idea of God coming out of heaven and attaching an arm or a leg when we were being made in our mother's womb. Instead, we sort of see God creating us together through developmental or embryological processes. So too when it comes to evolution. There's no need of God coming in and adding different species or different features to species over evolutionary time. Second, both embryology and evolution reflect intelligent design. I love Psalm 139, where it says, We have been knit together in our mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, interestingly, when it comes to intelligent design, I have double that of the anti-evolutionists. In other words, I agree with young earth creationists that uh, the world is structured to reflect design. Completely agree with them. However, my design argument's even greater because I include the evolutionary processes over the eons of time. And finally, in both embryology and evolution, the image of God and human sin are manifested. Now, I don't think there is an actual point say in our own personal development that this happens and neither during the evolutionary process and as a consequence I think this is a mysterious manifestation. Now lecture 8 in my audio lectures I'm going to deal with this a little more specifically but the point I'd like to make here is during evolution humans began to emerge and they started bearing the image of God and they became morally culpable and all fell into sin. So did sin enter the world during evolution? The answer is absolutely yes. Well those were some introductory comments about evolutionary creation. Let's get on to the issue and deal with biblical interpretation. I became a Christian 30 years ago, and it was through reading this old Bible, a King James Version, 